Good morning, everyone. This is Jose Romero. We are ready to start the second day of the October ACIP meeting. Um, I hope you've all slept well. We've had some power issues here in Atlanta. Um, so um, I'm going to begin by gaveling uh, the meeting to order. Sorry, no gavel, just my knuckles. Um, so uh, we're going to take an abbreviated um, roll call this morning, just the ACIP members. I'm going to call your names and please indicate whether you're present. No need to um, give uh, affiliations or conflicts of interest. So um, I will begin. So uh, Dr. Robert Atmar. Present. Dr. Kevin Alt. Okay, I'll come back to that. Ms. Lynn Bada. I'll come back. Dr. Beth Bell. Present. Dr. Hank Bernstein. Okay, I'll come back. Dr. Sharon Fry. Present. Dr. Paul Hunter. Present. Dr. Grace Lee. Ms. Veronica McNally. Present. Dr. Kathy, uh, Kat, Catherine Paling. I'll come back. Dr. Pablo Sanchez. Present. Thank you. Dr. Peter Salaji. Present. Dr. Kip Talbot. Present. Starting from the top, Dr. Kevin Alt. Ms. Lynn Bata. Kevin's here. He's unmuted, but he has to be on audio. <clears throat> um, Dr. Hank Bernstein. Oh, Dr. Catherine Paling. Oh, I called you. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Lynn, are you on? All right, we'll come back and, and uh, fill in the, gla the gaps here. Let's do the agency updates first. So um, let me begin with uh, uh, Dr. Messonnier. Great, thank you. You'll be hearing more about CDC's response to the COVID-19 pandemic tomorrow, but I wanted to share a few notes about the breadth of CDC's work on this response. CDC has been actively responding to the COVID-19 pandemic for nearly 300 days. In fact, today is day 298 since NCRD activated in January. 7,400 CDC staff have participated in the response, representing 3.5 million hours logged in responding to this event. And given that CDC staff is about 10,000 people total, you'll see that you know, the vast majority of CDC staff have been engaged directly in the response, and I expect the rest have been engaged in filling behind those who have been deployed. Tomorrow you'll hear about our epidemiology and vaccine-related activities, but CDC staff remain committed to responding more broadly, including activities to support data and analytics, laboratory diagnostics and testing, global migration, including traveler's health, contact tracing, state and tribal support, health systems, and mitigation for schools, work sites, and food systems. Um, I next want to turn to talk about routine vaccine coverage, something that we're not going to be talking about at this meeting, but I know something that the ACIP members care a lot about. Um, we recently published results from the 2009 NIST and NIS child surveys. Both reports identify strong immunization coverage, but also areas where we can do more to reduce disparities. Um, the results of the 2019 NIS child um, found that, for example, only 1.2% of children had received no vaccinations by age 24 months, but we continued to see disparities in coverage by race, ethnicity, poverty, um, and metropolitan statistical area. NIS child was released in August. Adolescent vaccination generally was showing improvement. However, um, we all realize that the impact of the COVID 
vaccine pandemic on childhood immunization is actually pretty extreme. And despite lots of efforts, we're still seeing lagging child and adolescent vaccination coverage. I think the gap in um, measles vaccine is telling. We're apparently somewhere around 1.5 million doses of measles vaccine behind where we should be this year. And that means a large number of children um, unprotected against routine childhood diseases. And so this is really a, a call to action to everyone at this meeting that we need to ensure that children are caught up on their vaccinations. You know, if they fall behind, they continue to fall behind. And that puts us at risk for vaccine preventable disease epidemics, as well as for um, um, HPV, for example, and the cancers related to it. So I hope that you will join us in really trying to emphasize the importance of getting people back to get caught up on these visits. Um, you heard about our flu vaccine activities yesterday, but I want to emphasize that we're also um, working to improve flu coverage in this season and to address disparities in flu vaccination and flu outcomes. Our estimates from last season show that vaccine coverage increased slightly among adults from the previous season, yet racial ethnic disparities in flu vaccination coverage persist. And in an average year, more than half of U.S. adults remain unprotected against flu. A recent analysis of, um, of flu hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity during 10 flu seasons showed that non-Hispanic Black persons had the highest flu hospitalization rates, followed by non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaskan Natives, and then Hispanic or Latino persons compared to non-Hispanic whites. Among other activities to address these ongoing disparities, CDC, the AMA, and the Ad Council launched a collaborative campaign called No Time for Flu to increase awareness about the importance of flu vaccination, especially among African American and Hispanic audiences. This year, we're seeing a large upsurge in demand for flu vaccine compared to other, um, other years. I think that's great news, but what we need is help sustaining that um, increase throughout the entire sort of last quarter of this year. You know, we want to, we, we optimally want everyone vaccinated in October, but we need to keep passing the message along that if folks didn't get their vaccine in October, November and December, it's still not too late to get vaccinated. Um, uh, Acute flaccid myelitis is something we've talked about, even though it's not vaccine preventable. It's uncertain how the COVID-19 pandemic and recommended social distancing will affect enterovirus circulation in the, in the U.S., but we were prepared for a surge in cases, considering that we thought 2020 would follow the pattern of national increases in AFM every two years. And in fact, we're not seeing that this year. So um, we are still on high alert for AFM, but we will need to um, continue to determine the impact of social distancing on that as well as on other respiratory viral diseases. Finally, um, you know, in a time where there is so much bad news, I, I, I want to end on a happy note, which is that um, World Polio Day was celebrated last week, October 24th as an opportunity to highlight global efforts towards a polio-free world and honor the tireless contributions of those on the front lines in the fight to eradicate polio from every corner in the globe. This year, there is additional reason to celebrate. On October 25th, 2020, the Africa region was officially certified as wild polio virus free. With the African region certification, five of the six WHO regions, representing over 90% of the world's population, are now free of wild polio virus. Thanks for the time, I'll turn it back. Thank you very much for that update. Um, next, um, uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medi Medica Medicare Services, please update. Thank you. This is Mary Beth Hans from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, I have a few updates. Yesterday, CMS issued the fourth COVID-19 interim final rule with comment period that addresses coverage of COVID-19 vaccines in Medicare, Medicaid, and private health plans. In addition, CMS issued three COVID-19 toolkits aimed at state Medicaid agencies, providers who will administer COVID vaccine, and health insurance plans. All of these materials are available on, med uh, 
on CMS.gov. Regarding flu, CMS has coordinated with CDC on the release of their flu campaign materials. Flu materials include videos, flyers, and drop-in articles, all in both Spanish and English, and they're all available on Medicare.gov. In addition, consumers who subscribe for email updates from Medicare have received a specific email about the importance of flu vaccine. Postcards have also been sent to those who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid, and the CMS Office of Minority Health has also included flu vaccine information on their website. Specific to pediatric vaccines, CMS has repeatedly emphasized the importance of routine immunizations to states and other partners. In both June and July, CDC ISD staff joined CMS calls with both state Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program staff and emphasized the need for catch-up vaccines. CMS has a Connecting Kids to Coverage campaign and materials specific to vaccines are available on that website. Thank you. Thank you very much for that update. Um, Food and Drug Administration update, please. Hi, good morning. This is Doran Fink for FDA. Earlier this month, FDA published guidance on data to support emergency use authorization of last week by an open uh, session of the vaccines and related for a general discussion of considerations for the development, licensure, and or emergency use authorization of COVID-19 preventive vaccines. I will be uh, discussing the uh, VRPAC meeting in more detail uh, during the COVID-19 vaccine session tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much for your update. Um, next, uh, Health Resources and Services Administration update, please. Good morning, this is Mary Rubin. Thank you for allowing me to provide update on the Division of Injury Compensation Program activities. The National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, VICP, continues to process an increased number of claims. In fiscal year 2020, petitioners filed 1,191 claims with the program. 186.8 million was awarded to petitioners and 31 million was awarded to pay attorney's fees and costs. In addition, at the end of fiscal year 2020, HRSA had a backlog of 966 vaccine injury claims awaiting for review. As of October 1, 2020, the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, CICP, determined that 39 claims were eligible for compensation, totaling 6 million. The um, CICP also published a notice of proposed rulemaking for the counter uh, for the smallpox countermeasures injury compensation uh, for injury table, and this was published in the Federal Register on 10 um, 15, 2020. The comment period ends on December 14, 2020. That ends my update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Indian Health Services, please. Good morning, this is Tom Weiser from Indian Health Service. Um, we have several updates on COVID planning. So IHS has established a COVID vaccine task force to develop agency-wide plan for vaccine allocation and distribution to IHS tribal and urban health facilities who choose to receive their vaccine from IHS. The IHS vaccine uh, task force teams uh, are focused on distribution, prioritization, administration, communication, data management, and safety. Uh, regarding VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Monitoring through VAERS and active internal reporting systems have um, <clears throat> based on, are, that are based on current monitoring for COVID-19 treatments have been developed. The IHS appreciates the development of a new element in VAERS this year for the first time for reporting specifically to IHS. <clears throat> IHS Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee uh, will be providing outreach to uh, IHS tribal and urban Indian health program sites to ensure they are familiar with reporting systems and understand the importance of close safety monitoring. Regarding COVID-19 in general, while data published in the MMWR in August described at least a threefold higher incidence of COVID-19 for American Indians and Alaska Natives compared to non-Hispanic whites, data on underlying conditions, hospitalizations, and mortality 
is insufficient at this time to fully assess the severity of this COVID-19 pandemic in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Despite this, IHS greatly appreciates the continued assistance provided by the CDC Tribal Support Unit, as mentioned previously. Regarding um, uh, influenza and reporting, the IHS is monitoring influenza-like illness for the 2020-2021 influenza season and has also created a developmental COVID-like illness surveillance report. Influenza vaccination activities demonstrate higher uptake of influenza vaccine early in the season compared to previous years. As of October 10th, 2020, 11.6% have received at least one dose of seasonal flu and influenza vaccine in uh, patients six months and older compared to 8.5% at the same time last year. And finally, regarding routine and catch-up immunizations, uh, during COVID-19 reported American Indian Alaska Native childhood immunization coverage has decreased. IHS has engaged in various initiatives to promote routine and catch-up immunizations during COVID-19. This has included hosting webinars, sharing CDC and HHS communication and education materials, provider resources and toolkits. And again, IHS appreciates the ongoing support of CDC in these efforts as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, National Institutes of Health update, please. Yeah, good. Yeah, good morning. This is John Beigel uh, reporting for the NIH. Uh, there are just a few uh, updates that I think might be of interest to the committee. Uh, number one, there was a report in New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago for the NIAID phase one study of the mRNA uh, 1273, the Moderna uh, vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, this was a follow-on to a prior report, but this is important because this actually detailed the experience in older adults um, uh, defined uh, in this study as age 56 years and older. And it showed that the vaccine is well tolerated and generated uh, a very robust immune uh, response. And that set the stage for uh, having that population in the larger pivotal uh, uh, studies. Um, uh, NIAID continues to support the large pivotal phase three studies through its COVID-19 prevention network, or what we call CoVPN. Um, uh, about a week ago, Moderna completed their full enrollment into the mRNA-1273 phase three study. Uh, and a fourth uh, vaccine study has actually been uh, started. This one is the, the Johnson, the, the Janssen, which is the J&J &J product um, so this gives us four large pivotal studies currently ongoing uh, to try to get an effective vaccine for this, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and then shifting just to briefly to AFM, uh, NIAID uh, awarded a, a contract to begin development of a vaccine for intravirus uh, D68, uh, which is the, as everyone knows, the respiratory virus that causes the acute flaccid uh, myelitis. So this is a uh, this is just beginning uh, development, but we think is it critically needed in order to uh, uh, prevent uh, this, uh, this this devastating disease. And those are the updates from the uh, the NIH. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Office of Infectious Diseases and HIV Aid Policy, please. To help support the uh, um, flu vaccination efforts by CDC and other agencies. So ORDP created an online toolkit uh, that provides uh, materials designed to encourage everyone to get their flu vaccine by Halloween. The uh, Food to the Flu toolkit uh, includes social media graphics, posts, and, and, and others uh, to help drive the CDC messaging about getting the flu vaccine by the end of October. Um, partners can use any of these materials that they would like by visiting uh, vaccines.gov and OIDP will continue to promote flu vaccination through the flu, uh, throughout the flu season. Um, OIDP has continued to work on uh, an updated national vaccine plan uh, with support from the Interagency Vaccine Work Group, whose members include the federal agencies represented in a a a ACIP uh, plus others. Uh, the national vaccine plan is scheduled to undergo an abbreviated uh, round of public comment period in November and, uh, and uh, we're planning on releasing the report, uh, the, the plan, 
uh, by the end of 2020 or in early 2021. The National Vaccine Advisory Committee, NVAC, met, in, uh, met on October 16 and reviewed a draft report containing responses to questions on COVID-19 vaccine um, vaccination posed by uh, Admiral Brett Gerard, the Assistant Secretary for Health. The committee will meet again in December to continue work on this and, uh, and, and will potentially take a vote at that time in the report. The NVAC website will be updated once the meeting date has been finalized. Um, so this concludes uh, updates from OIDP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your updates. Um, so what we will do now is uh, proceed uh, to the cholera vaccine presentation, and that will be followed by the vote that was uh, delayed from yesterday. Um, and then we will resume the normally noted schedule um, on your handouts. So um, if I could ask uh, Dr. Pablo Sanchez to give the work group introduction. Dr. Sanchez. Hi, thank you, Jose. Um, so so um, I want to introduce the color vaccine work group. Um, I'll be the chair of um, Pablo Sanchez. Next slide. Um, the work group members consist of, as you see here, other ACIP members, ex officio members, um, liaison representatives, consultants. And I really want to give a, um, a strong um, you know, show of support to our CDC lead, Jen Collins, who's been absolutely wonderful in forming this group. Others, next slide. Other CDC contributors are listed here. Next slide. So background and purpose. Well, in 2017, ACIP recommended the cholera vaccine for adult travelers aged 18 to 64 years from the United States to an area of active cholera transmission. So this work group now will review more recent data in pediatrics to inform whether ACIP should recommend cholera vaccine for those travelers aged two to 17 years. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So the, po the policy topic that we will consider is should ACIP cholera, uh, cholera vaccine um, recommendations be expanded to include children and adolescents aged 2 to 17 years. Next. So we will developing evidence-based recommendations using the GRADE approach and then eventually uh, update MMR on, on the uh, recommendations of the ACIP. Next slide. So thank you, uh, but I do want to say, mention one other aspect is that, um, that the, uh, the company um, Emergent Biosolutions that makes the cholera vaccine uh, has actually um, continued, made the decision to temporarily discontinue the product distribution as of December 17th, 2020, uh, due to significant reductions in demand. And um, welcome to take any questions, but uh, representatives of the company are are on the are on the call here as well. Um, and you know, if they would like to say some words about that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Schneider. I'm happy to speak briefly on behalf of Emergent, if that's uh, okay with the committee. Please go forward. Thank you. Um, so good morning, I'm Dr. Mark Schneider, and I'm here actually representing medical affairs uh, for the Vaccines Division of Emergent Biosolutions. Uh, I'm also joined by my colleague, Dr. Stephanie uh, Campbell. Um, thank you both um, you know, for the question and the invite here uh, and the opportunity to speak. Emergent has made a very difficult decision to temporarily discontinue distribution of Vaxcora and Vivatif uh, due to market reduction in demand. Uh, Emergent continuously assesses travel data from a wide range of sources to include, but not limited to, uh, government institutions, external research firms, and industry experts that all point to a protracted recovery period for international travel due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Pending further notification, uh, the last shipment date for Vaxcora and Vivatif 
will be December 17th of 2020. Uh, customers can continue to order the product through that date. All product um, being distributed today through December 17th will have an expiration of January of 2021 for Vivotif and June of 2021 for Vaxcora. With that said, please understand that Emergent remains fully committed to addressing the needs of public health and travel medicine as we seek to properly position ourselves for the anticipated return of global travel uh, and our products to market in the near future. Um, excuse me, will, excuse us, sure. excuse us. We apologize, we did not realize that you were on the agenda um, and this would not be the appropriate time on the agenda to, um, to, to speak. Uh, we need to uh, only have our agenda uh, we need to follow our agenda uh, and not have outside companies speak unless they were uh, previously approved. Um, so can you please hold on your comments and we will try to find some time to add you to the agenda at a later time. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for your com the confusion. So um, I'm sorry about that. But, um, Regardless, um, I, I did want to remind people that, um, that the Vaxora is the only licensed um, and approved vaccine, color vaccine. Uh, but our work group will be um, looking at the pedi at a pediatric indication or recommendation, I should say. Thank you. Did you Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, um, let me go back and uh, take the uh, role of the individuals that were uh, missing initially, um, Dr. Alt. Um, indicated that he was having some audio problems. Um, Kevin, uh, Dr. Roth, have you resolved your problems? I hope so. <laughs> I'm here and I have no contacts. That, thank you very much. Um, so just your, just stay present. No need to uh, to state comments. Uh, sorry, conflicts at this time. Uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Lynn Bada. Uh, I am here. Uh, sorry about that. My computer died right at the. No, no apologies necessary. Um, Dr. Bernstein. Good morning. Sorry, I had diff technical difficulties as well. I am present. No apologies necessary. L lastly, uh, Dr. Uh, Paling. Present. Thank you. Thank you all. So uh, we have uh, a full attendance of the members. Um, and so uh, we will now proceed. Uh, to the uh, vote from yesterday, which is the immunization schedules. Um, Dr. Friedman, will you take over, please? Okay, so um, before the vote, I just wanted to review um, what we discussed and what the, the issues were that were pending and just present um, a few quick slides before the vote. So the first issue that came up was the wording um, under the child schedule, the notes for the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis or Tdap vaccination. There was a, um, a comment about combining the second and third bullet um, because um, we wanted to emphasize that Tdap may be administered regardless of the interval since the last tetanus and diphtheria containing, containing vaccine. And um, it does apply to pregnancy. Um, so there was a request to combine the two uh, bullets. However, it also does apply to some other situations. For example, if a child inadvertently was given Tdap between seven and nine years of age, they would still um, be uh, recommended to get a Tdap booster at age 11 to 12 years of age. And so we wanted to go ahead and keep those bullets separate um, because it does apply to more than just pregnancy. Um, if I can get the slides to advance, there we go. Um, I wanted to show table one of the child schedule just to um, show um, in the highlighted cell here that we have used the asterisk alone without any text overlay. And that is in um, preparation for um, the table three uh, comment that we had yesterday. If I can get the slides to advance. go. Um, we uh, have 
taken the recommendation for measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and human papillomavirus to have just risk um, and remove language that said not recommended. And then um, the key for the red will indicate that vaccinate, the, the asterisk indicates vaccinate after pregnancy. Um, we will be adding a line space between the word administered and asterisk vaccine after pregnancy so it stands out more. Then on the adult schedule for table two, um, we decided to leave not recommended with an asterisk for VAR, MMR, and HPV um, because the adult schedule has traditionally used more text overlay, so we will leave that. For um, recombinant zoster vaccine, for the pregnancy column, we changed it from a red with the not recommended asterisk text overlay to gray, which means there is no recommendation, which is exactly what is the published um, recommendation. And so that would make that there is no recommendation for pregnancy, immunocompromised, and HIV infection, because that is the guidance right now. So um, those were the changes that were requested or the discussions that we had. Those are our proposals, and um, we are now um, ready for the vote. And the vote is to recommend the proposed edits to both the 2021 adult and child and adolescent immunization schedules. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so uh, any questions or comments from uh, the voting members? From the liaisons, any questions or comments? OK. Uh, then um, I need a motion uh, from uh, the voting members uh, to accept uh, the wording, as stated, recommend the proposed edits to the 2021 adult and child adolescent immunization schedules as presented. Do I have a motion? Uh, Dr. Atmar, I see your hand went up first. Do you make a motion? Dr. Atmar, are, are you still having audio problems? Um, let me go then to uh, Dr. Paling. Dr. Paling, do you want a motion? This is Dr. Atmar. I'm oh. so moved. Okay, thank you, Dr. Atmar. Um, I need a second, please. I will second. Thank you very much. I will second. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Okay, so uh, open for discussion. All right. So um, I'm going to read the list of names and um, please indicate whether you are uh, in favor of uh, uh, the recommendation or against. So uh, alphabetically, uh, Dr. Atmar, please. I will come back to you, Dr. Atmar. Um, Dr. Alt. In favor. Thank you. Doc, uh, sorry, Ms. Bata. I will come back to uh, uh, Ms. Bata. Thank you, members. We are enabling your unmute buttons. Please try again. So I'm going to run through the list of names, and please just indicate if you are able to unmute. Um, Dr. Atmar? Uh, you are. Yes, Atmar, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Alt? Yes. Dr. Bata, I'm Ms. Bata. Yes. Dr. Bell? Yes. Dr. Bernstein? Yes. Dr. Fry? Dr. Fry? Sherry. Sherry may still be having problems. 
Um, Dr. Hunter. Hunter, yes. Dr. Lee, can you unmute? Yes. Okay. Lee, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ms. McNally. Yes. Dr. Paling. Yes. Dr. Sanchez. Yes. Dr. Salaji. Yes. Dr. Talbot. Yes. Okay. Let me go back to Dr. Fry. Dr. Fry, are you able to unmute? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to try to take the vote. Don't. We'll we'll go forward here very quickly. So uh, indicate whether you are in favor. Yes. Uh, or against uh, the recommendation, no. Dr. Atmar. Atmar, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Ms. Bata. Yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Dr. Bernstein. Bernstein, yes. Dr. Fry. Fry, yes. Dr. Hunter. Hunter, yes. Dr. Lee. Lee, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Salaji. Salaji, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. And Romero, yes. So the motion uh, passes unanimously. Um, we will adopt the schedule as uh, was indicated. Thank you very much and uh, forgive the technical difficulties. So um, we're now going to move on to the uh, Zoster vaccine. Um, and we'll have an introduction by Dr. Uh, Lee. Um, you can all uh, mute yourselves at this moment, please. Thanks very much. Um, so this is Grace Lee. I am the chair of the Herpes Zoster Work Group. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. I first wanted to acknowledge our 2020 Herpes Zoster Work Group members, including Lynn Bata, who is an ACIP member, our ex officio and liaison representatives and our consultants who are providing important expertise on key issues related to the use of recombinant zoster vaccine. And especially would like to thank Dr. Tara Anderson for her leadership of this group. Next slide. Can I have the, thank you. Um, as a reminder, the ACIP made the following recommendations in October of 2017. First, that recombinant zoster vaccine, uh, which we'll call RZV going forward, is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications for immunocompetent adults aged 50 and older. Second, that RZV is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications for immunocompetent adults who previously received zoster vaccine live or ZVL. And number three, that RZV is preferred over uh, ZVL for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications. The evidence and rationale for the decision um, in October, 2017 can be found in Dr. Dooling's publication in MMWR listed here, along with the grade tables on the ACIP website. Next slide. Uh, since that time, there have been a few notable updates. First, for ZVL, effective July 1st, 2020, Zostavax it will no longer be sold in the United States. The remaining product will expire by November 18th, 2020. And second, at RZV, uh, Shingrix, uh, 33 million doses have been distributed from launch through the second quarter of 2020. Shingrix inventory um, is currently available to meet the demand across all distribution channels. Um, and third, that the European Commission or the EMA approved an expanded indication on August 25th, 2020. So Shingrix is now approved in the European Union for prevention of herpes zoster and post-herpetic neuralgia in adults 50 and older and, and, and adults 18 years of age or older who are at increased risk of herpes zoster. Next slide. Uh, one more update. Um, oh, actually, can we go back one slide? I apologize. 
I did want to update um, just verbally that a supplemental biologics license application or BLA was submitted to the US FDA on September 24th, 2020 to expand the indication of Shingrix to include the prevention of herpes zoster in adults 18 years of age or older who are at increased risk for um, zoster due to immunodeficiency or immunosuppression caused by either disease or therapy. Um, so uh, following uh, the uh, uh, European Commission's approval. Next slide. Another important update to highlight in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, in adults 65 and older in the US, uh, we have been uh, reviewing weekly uptake data for RZV between January and July 2019, shown by the blue bars, that was um, steady and increasing over time. However, during the same time period between January and July 2020, shown in the orange bars here, we saw a steep decline in the number of doses administered after the national emergency was declared on March 13th. Um, and this is concerning because we have a cohort of older adults who may not be protected against herpes zoster and its complications. These numbers are now rising and we anticipate that we'll continue to track how the pandemic is affecting healthcare utilization and vaccination rates in the US. Um, but I also wanted to just take a moment and echo Dr. Massonier's comments from earlier today that we hope our immunization partners will continue to support vaccination efforts for all age groups during the pandemic. So it's affecting children, adolescents, and adults um, throughout our healthcare systems. Next slide. In June 2019, the ACIP workgroup presented a summary of RZV post licensure safety monitoring updates from three. Uh, federal safety surveillance systems, VAERS, VSD, and uh, CMS or Medicare, as well as a summary of the herpes zoster workgroup interpretation of these findings. The workgroup has, had met, uh, has met 14 more times since uh, that time to review the data on RZV post licensure safety and uptake monitoring, RZV efficacy and immunogenicity in both immunocompetent and immunocompromised adults, um, and we have developed the PICO question for use of RZV in immunocompromised adults in order to develop the evidence to recommendations framework needed to guide a recommendation. Next slide. So today we'd like to focus on RZV safety monitoring updates and next steps. The presentations today will include an update on post licensure safety monitoring of RZV in VAERS a VSD update on post-licensure safety monitoring of RZV, um, data on the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome following herpes zoster infection, and a summary and planned risk-benefit analysis regarding the use of RZV in immunocompetent adults. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleagues. So our next presentation, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, so our next presentation will be by Dr. John Su on the update uh, on post-licensure uh, safety monitoring of recombinant zoster vaccine um, in the uh, vaccine adverse event reporting system. Um, and then uh, we'll be followed by Dr. Nelson. We will hold questions until after the presentation by Dr. Nelson. Dr. Sue, please. Hi. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Sorry, I'm not hearing at all. Thank you very much for letting us know, Dr. Bell. We're, we're working on, a, on the difficulty here. Just a second. People can hear me. <laughs> so, Dr. S Dr. Morning, Sue, it, and thank you for having me this morning. Yes, Next thank slide, you. Please. Excellent. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, okay, and there's a second slide with the standard disclaimer. Next slide, thank you. So just a little brief reminder that uh, VAERS is a uh, passive surveillance uh, system co-managed by CDC and FDA. Uh, next slide, please. 
and I do apologize on calling in over a cell phone due to power outage issues. So the data may be a little slower on my end. So once, uh, as mentioned, here is a passive reporting system. And so if uh, people wish to file a report with VAERS, they can go to VAERS.hhs.gov uh, and access the website that you see on this slide and fill um, an electronic form online uh, with the different data elements collected, a few of which are shown on the slide here. In a available PDF where people can fill that data in offline, and then submit at their leisure. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, um, theirs is a passive reporting system. And so we accept uh, reports from all reporters. Um, and uh, as a result, we don't really accept, uh, we don't pass judgment on causality or the clinical severity of the event. I'm seeing some texts that indicate that people are not hearing me okay. Should I continue talking? Um, go, go ahead. So let me explain for uh, those listening in. Um, so the Atlanta area had had some very severe storms last night with uh, trees down and power outages. Um, and uh, this is probably affecting uh, communications. Uh, we're having problems com with communications here at the, the control center. So we will continue to work through this as uh, we can. Uh, please bear with us. It is uh, beyond our control. Thank you very much. Please go ahead, Dr. Jose, Sue. This is, Jose, this is Tom Shimabakro. Can you hear me okay? I can, Tom. Do you want me just to take over? Yes. I, I can I can I can attempt to do this. I should be okay. Thank you. Um, I'm in my office, so I, I can do this. Thank you, Tom. John, um, we appreciate your effort to, to, to get this done. Um, let's let's give it over to, to Tom. Um, I'm getting a nod from Dr. Messonnier and from uh, from uh, Amanda Cohn and Jessica. So um, go ahead, uh, Tom. Thank you very much for volunteering. Sure. So as 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 Dr. Sue was saying, VARES is our passive surveillance system. Um, that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Um, as a, as a, the strengths of VAERS Ver, are that it can rapidly detect safety signals and can detect rare adverse events. It's subject to the limitations of passive surveillance systems in general. The main limitation is generally we cannot assess causality from VAERS data alone. VAERS accepts all reports from all reporters. It does not judge causality or clinical severity. It's an early warning system. So it is a signal detection or hypothesis generating system um, and requires, if we do identify signals um, that need additional follow-up, we need to move to more robust systems. Next slide. So this is uh, some data from an MMWR on that was published in 2019, um, uh, which was the initial published data um, uh, following the rollout of Shingrix. And if you, as you see from this data, um, most uh, most reports uh, were non-serious, 97%, and that's consistent with what we see for other vaccines administered in this age group, namely flu vaccine. The uh, most common adverse events were um, systemic symptoms like fever, chills, headache, and also injection site reactions. Next slide. Um, so what we've done is we've gone and updated uh, th that um, analysis with data running through October of 2020. And we're, we're really not, although there are more reports, as you will see, we're really not seeing any appreciable changes in the safety profile of uh, Shingrix vaccine as um, more individuals have been vaccinated. Um, we still have uh, the breakdown of serious versus non-serious at about 97 percent, which is consistent with the initial data. And our, I will mention RZV is primarily given alone. Over 90 percent of these doses are administered um, without other concomitant vaccines. Next slide. And again, this is uh, the, the more detailed breakdown of the specific adverse events as coded um, by MEDRA. 
and you can see they look very similar to the initial data, um, mainly uh, uh, systemic reactions like fever, headache, fatigue, and also and chills, and also injection site reactions as well. Next slide. So um, you will recall that there was a signal in uh, in VSD rapid cycle analysis fairly early on for Guillain-Barré syndrome. Um, and there was also um, a finding of uh, an association um, when, we, when we went to the CMS data with our partners in FDA. And we're presenting the slide just to give you an update on what we're seeing as far as various reports for GBS. So during the period there, October 2017 <coughs> to April 2019, there were 40 six uh, reports of GBS, 31 met, met Brighton criteria. Um, when, we, uh, when we moved to the next period, um, May 29 through October 2020, we had 44 additional reports of GBS. Um, 27 met the Brighton criteria where one is the highest level of certainty. Um, 16 were physician di uh, I'm sorry, uh, 16 of those met Brighton level and there and 11 were physician diagnosed. And 93% uh, of these developed symptoms within 42 days of vaccination, which is the um, risk window we use for, for, for monitoring. Next slide. And I will mention just before I get to the data mining that, that there will be a following me will be a presentation on the VSD surveillance. So, um, in, in, in data mining, we did have one data mining finding um, that was product administered to patient of inappropriate age, which is a medication error. Um, so uh, a data mining finding, but not, not an adverse event um, um, following an immunization, not an adverse health event following an immunization. Next slide. So in summary, as of October 2020, the RZV post licensure safety monitoring findings in VARES are generally consistent with the safety profile observed in the pre-licensure clinical trials. Most reported um, systemic adverse events or injection site reactions, serious adverse events were rare, 2.6% um, of reports, and that's similar to other vaccines administered in this age group. Um, the number and the composition of reports for GBS were comparable um, when looking, uh, comparing to the last update, and there were no, no disproportionality findings other than that medication error of inappropriate age. Next slide. So I'd like to thank the following individuals, and uh, um, are we moving on to the next presentation or taking questions now? Uh, we're going to wait uh, until the end of the next presentation. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Nelson, do you have a good enough link to give your presentation? I believe so. Can you hear me? We can. It sounds pretty clear. Um, and let me just uh, commend John because um, previously before you begin, because I understand that he was in his garage with a, a generator trying to make his call. So thank you very much for having to, for attempting to do that. And, and please go ahead, uh, Dr. Nelson. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'll be presenting the vaccine safety data link update on safety monitoring of RZV. Next slide. I wanna acknowledge um, a broad team that helped with this work. It's led out of KP Washington, um, but in collaboration with many colleagues at CDC and other VSD sites. Next slide. So as a reminder, the VSD is a public health and research collaboration that was established in 1990 between CDC and eight integrated healthcare organizations in the US. It captures and curates medical and demographic data currently on over about 12 million people or about 3.7% of the US population. Next slide. The VSD captures and links electronically available data elements, as well as conducts manual review of medical charts since these data are not collected for research purposes. The key domains are shown here, which include immunizations, potential adverse events that are defined primarily using ICD-9 or 10 codes that occur in outpatient emergency department or inpatient settings. Next slide. So the results that I'll share today for RZV were obtained using, using um, 
VSD's targeted surveillance methodology that uses data like these from across the VSD. Um, this methodology is also referred to as rapid cycle analysis. It was established in 2006 for conducting near real-time vaccine safety monitoring. And like a traditional epidemiologic study that you may be familiar with, we pre-specify our primary vaccine exposure, in this case RZV, and comparator populations that we think will work well. We identify um, and pre-specify adverse event outcome targets of interest, typically about five to 10, as well as potential factors that may confound the relationship between exposure and, uh, and outcome. However, unlike a traditional epidemiologic study, instead of waiting for a typical um, study to two-year study to say complete and do a single analysis at the end of that period, in, this, in rapid surveillance, we routinely and cumulatively update the study data over time potentially weekly or monthly, and then we conduct repeated interim analyses over time to compare risks between groups. Statistically significant findings are deemed to be preliminary signals that are fully investigated with numerous follow activities, including chart validation often to confirm true incident cases. Next slide. So here are the design details for the RZV surveillance activity. We aim to sequentially monitor RZV among adults 50 years of age and older during the uptake period um, initially for RZV, which in the VSD was January 2018, and we followed through December 2019. Our primary analysis involved comparing RZV recipients with um, those who received Zostavax historically in the prior two to five years. Secondary analysis involved age comparable concurrent comparators. So those who had either a well visit or received another vaccine like pneumonia or Tdap during the, the RZV uptake period. We measured a number of baseline covariates, including dose, receipt of concomitant vaccines, prior receipt of ZVL, healthcare utilization measures, as well as a number of medical conditions. In terms of the sequential testing plan, the interim analysis involved conducting our first analysis after six months of uptake in June of 2018, and then conducting 18 more monthly analysis subsequently. Next slide. So we designated two sets of pre-specified health outcomes of interest listed in these two bullets. We conducted formal sequential analyses for 10 high priority outcomes occurring incidentally in the one to 42 days post-vaccination. They're listed here. Um, anaphylaxis is one outcome where the outcome window is much shorter, zero to one days post-vaccination. We also conducted an exploratory analysis for a number of other outcomes um, that are listed in the second bullet, either one to 42 days post-vaccination for outcomes like gout and pneumonia, or one to seven days for systemic and local reactions. Next slide. So here's a plot of RZV uptake over time in our study. Um, at the time of our final monthly analysis, which is indicated by the vertical dashed line, we had, we'd observed almost 650,000 doses. And as you can see, we had steady uptake during the approximately two year surveillance period. Next slide. So here are the primary sequential results for our 10 primary outcomes. Uh, the outcomes of interest are shown down the rows and in the, in the table across the columns, we show the observed number of events among RZV recipients the number of events expected based on historical rates in, in ZVL recipients, the observed rate per 100,000 um, people, doses, um, the relative risk, and then whether or not a preliminary signal was identified. So as you can see here, for most outcomes, there was no preliminary signal observed and the estimated relative risk was less than one. We did I detect two preliminary signals, one for Bell's palsy at the fifth analysis when there were 36 observed events as compared to 24 that were expected, that was led to a rest estimated relative risk of 1.5. But this effect, effect has attenuated over time with twice as much data and the relative risk currently shown here, as you can see, is 0.9 below one. We also observed a preliminary signal very early on for GBS. This was at the second look where we observed three events within the Shingrix group compared to less than one event expected based on historical data. The relative risk estimated at that time was over five. And as you can see now, that effect has also attenuated considerably. The relative risk is currently estimated based on these data at 1.24. 
Um, it is only based on about six presumptive adverse events, however, and so there's considerable uncertainty in this estimate. Next slide. We did considerable further follow-up on the preliminary GBS signal we found when using the ICD-10 ICD based coded definition. Um, and in particular, we conducted physician chart review to determine the true GBS status for these six presumptive cases. And so among those six, three of them were ruled out as they had symptoms prior to vaccination and three were confirmed, two as Brighton level two and one as Brighton level three. Um, we also conducted chart review among the historical cases. There were five such cases. Two of those were ruled out. One was unable to be validated. There wasn't enough information to make a diagnosis and two were confirmed both at Brighton level two. And so based on our chart validated outcome data, our best current estimates in the VSD of the relative risk are either 1.55 if we assume that two of those five ZVL cases are confirmed or 1.03 if we assume that all three of those um, cases were confirmed. So basically a sensitivity analysis here um, that depending on how you classify that one missing confirmed case. Next slide. So in summary, after receipt of about 650,000 doses of RZV, in the VSD between January 2018 and December 2019, we found a preliminary signal for Bell's palsy, but the effect did not persist as we accrued more doses. A preliminary signal was also observed for GBS, an effect that also waned over time. With chart review to, con to confirm the true case status for GBS, we found that VSD is not in a position to have sufficient evidence to determine whether or not there's an increased risk of GBS. The relative risk that we can estimate based on these data is 1.55, um, but the confidence intervals, as you can see here, are very wide and cross one, going from about zero to almost 18. And so overall, we don't have sustained evidence of increased risk among RZV recipients for any pre-specified outcome that we have followed. Um, we have done considerable subgroup and secondary analyses that provide further reassurance of these primary results that I've shown today. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Nelson. Do we have any questions from uh, the voting members or from the liaisons? Uh, Dr. Admar, please. Uh, yes, thank you for a very nice presentation. Can you remind us how you get the expected uh, number uh, that uh, is a comparator? Sure. So these are historical comparators who have received Zostavax Live in the five years prior to the uptake period for Shingrix. So the primary analyses are based on um, numbers of events that we observe in that population. And then um, they're uh, adjusted for age, gender, site, um, and for our cardiovascular outcomes for a, a couple of other factors um, to equalize between groups. Um, but these these results don't fully adjust for all the confounders. That's um, analyses that we currently have in progress using end of study um, cumulative data. Um, and we're conducting additional analyses that use um, com uh, compared a group other than the historical group. Uh, th thank you. So um, it, it would not account for uh, some other event that might be going through the community that could be associated with GBS. Is that my understanding correct? Can you say more about what you mean well, by so, so, for example, if if in the community uh, that were being surveyed during uh, the period of surveillance, there was some other um, infection, say that was uh, going through the community and was associated with GBS, uh, is it a is the control? I guess let me re-ask re the question: Is the control group a contemporaneous uh, uh, group that would take into account environmental and other issues going through the communities at the time, or, as I understood it, it's instead a, a historical group that might not account for environmental events, other infections that might be associated with GBS? Sure, I understand your question now, thank you. So this is, you're right, this is a historical comparator group. So any other changes um, 
over time during the period prior to Shingrix uptake compared to during Shingrix uptake, we can't untangle those differences. Differences that we might observe between the vaccine groups could be due to other things that changed during those two periods of time. Um, and that's why in our end of study analysis, we are using um, contemporaneous control groups, such as people who received well visits during the Shingrix period um, and also had a flu vaccine in the prior year um, or received other vaccinations during the Shingrix period. So, and those results um, provide us with similar information as what I've shown you today. Um, and so we've done a couple of, several different analyses to um, manage different biases that exist depending on the type of observational study design that we use. So we feel pretty good about the, the, bustness, the robustness of the findings we have here that I presented today. Thank you. Any other questions from the liaisons or from the voting members? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the next uh, set of talks. Um, so uh, Dr. Tara Anderson will be talking about the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome following herpes uh, zoster, and then a summary and planned risk-benefit analysis regarding use of uh, RZV in immunocompetent uh, adults. Uh, we'll hold questions until the end of the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Anderson, if you please. Okay, thank you, Dr. Romero, and thank you to Drs. Lee, Sue, and Shonmakuro, and Nelson for your presentations. I will now present a CDC-led analysis of the risk of Yambre syndrome following herpes zoster. First, for some background, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, is a rare immune-mediated disease of the peripheral nerves. In the United States, the estimated annual incidence of GBS across all ages is one to two cases per 100,000 persons. Risk factors for GBS include increasing age, male gender, immunocompromised status, previous viral and bacterial infections, and recent vaccinations, for example, some influenza and rabies vaccines. Regarding previous infections, the strongest evidence in the literature is for the viral and bacterial pathogens listed here. As the ACIP herpes zoster workgroup discussed RZV post-licensure safety monitoring results, it was noted that in some instances, both disease and vaccination have been associated with GBS. For example, as with influenza virus infection and some influenza vaccinations. Therefore, the group agreed it would be important to further explore the risk of GBS following herpes zoster. A possible temporal association between herpes zoster and GBS has been noted in a small number of case reports in the literature. And one previous epidemiologic study by Kang, Xu, and Lin reported an increased risk of GBS following recent zoster. In this population-based cohort study using Taiwan's National Health Insurance Research Database, the investigators found 0.03% of patients developed GBS within two months following zoster and the adjusted hazard of GBS during the follow-up period was 18.37 times greater for patients with herpes zoster than those without zoster. To our knowledge, there are no published epidemiologic studies in other settings or using other methods. We therefore conducted a case series study designed to strengthen our epidemiologic understanding of the risk of GBS following herpes zoster and to help clarify benefits versus potential risks of vaccination. The primary objective of the analysis was to evaluate the risk of GBS following herpes zoster using a self-controlled case series analysis of healthcare claims data from two large national data sources. And the secondary objective was to describe characteristics of these GBS cases, including demographics and outcome severity, such as duration of GBS hospitalization and ICU admission. I will now provide some brief background on the study methodology. The self-controlled case series method was developed in 1995 for use in vaccine safety studies, and it has since been broadly applied in epidemiology. This approach is used to examine the temporal association between a transient exposure, such as herpes zoster, and a subsequent event, such as GBS. The precise timing of the exposure and the event is important. Only individuals with both the exposure and the event of interest are included in the analysis. Each case serves as their own control. Therefore, confounding by time invariant factors is eliminated. The self-controlled case series method estimates the relative risk of rates in the risk window compared to rates in the control window. 
We used two data sources for this study. The first was the IBM MarketScan commercial databases, which include individual level de-identified healthcare claims for persons covered by employer-sponsored insurance. The MarketScan commercial data are a convenient sample drawn from IBM Watson Health's clients, which include approximately 30 to 50 million persons enrolled annually since 2006. The second data source was the CMS Medicare databases, which include individual level de-identified healthcare claims information for Medicare beneficiaries. The CMS Medicare data include a 100% sample of all fee-for-service clinical claims data from Medicare for approximately 50 to 60 million Medicare enrollees annually. Approximately one-third of Medicare beneficiaries are covered under Medicare Parts A, B, and D fee-for-service. For our study populations, from the market scan commercial databases, we included all persons 18 to 64 years of age during 2010 to 2018 for whom outpatient pharmaceutical claims data were available. From the CMS Medicare databases, we included all persons 65 years and older during 2014 to 2018 with enrollment in Medicare Parts A, B, and D. Of note, no drug data were available prior to 2014. In addition, we did not include beneficiaries enrolled in Medicare Part C or Medicare Advantage Managed Care Plans since drug claims data were not available for this population. For both data sources, persons included in the analysis had to be enrolled for 100, excuse me, from 180 days before through 365 days after herpes zoster. In the next few slides, I will summarize our study definitions. Herpes zoster cases were defined as persons with an outpatient claim with a primary or secondary ICD-9 or ICD-10 diagnostic code for herpes zoster. Since we wanted to capture incident zoster cases, we excluded persons in whom their first herpes zoster diagnostic code was a post-herpetic neuralgia or PHN code. We did retain persons with subsequent PHN codes. We also excluded persons with a claim for zoster vaccine, either Zostavax or Shingrix, within one day of their zoster diagnostic code, because this may more likely represent instances of miscoding. The herpes zoster index date was defined as the date of the first herpes zoster claim during the study period. For GBS, cases were defined as persons with an inpatient claim with a principal diagnostic code for GBS. To increase the specificity of the GBS diagnostic code, we required it to be paired with a procedural procedural code for lumbar puncture, electromyography, or a nerve conduction study, procedures which are typically part of the diagnostic procedures for patients with GBS. We excluded persons with GBS in the 180-day window prior to zoster and excluded persons with previous infections or Shingrix vaccination during the 42-day period prior to GBS. These infections included the previously noted viral infections of CMV, Epstein-Barr virus, influenza, hepatitis E, and Zika, and the bacterial infections Campylobacter jejuni and Mycoplasma pneumoniae that currently have the strongest evidence of association with GBS. We also evaluated several negative controls to validate our methods. We selected conditions that were similar to GBS and that they are acute conditions with an abrupt onset and a low rate of reoccurrence. We also selected these conditions because they were not expected to increase after herpes zoster. These negative controls included appendicitis, nephrolithiasis, cholecystitis, and fractures of the upper limb. And these were defined based on ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. We excluded persons with claims for these conditions in the 180-day window prior to zoster. As previously noted, we chose the self-controlled case series design in which only cases are included in the analysis and each case serves as their own control. In this analysis, we compared the rate of GBS or negative controls in the risk window as compared to the rate in the control window. The risk window for this study was the 1 to 42 day window after the herpes zoster index date, which is comparable to the period typically used in vaccine safety studies. We selected two control windows. The primary control window was the 100 to 365 day period from the zoster index date and the secondary control window was the 43 to 99 day period from the zoster index date. We used conditional Poisson regression to compare rates of visits in the risk window versus the two control windows. 
Now I will address the study results. We identified a total of 489,516 persons with herpes zoster aged 18 to 64 years from the 2010 to 2018 market scan commercial data, among whom 11 developed GBS during the 1 to 365 days following herpes zoster. We identified a total of 650,229 persons with herpes zoster aged 65 years and older from the 2014 to 2018 CMS Medicare data among whom 41 developed GBS during the 1 to 365 days following Zoster. The available age breakdown by data source is provided here. For the CMS Medicare data, cell sizes smaller than 11 are suppressed. For those 18 to 64 years, there's a slightly higher percentage of cases aged 50 to 64. For those 65 years and older, the highest percentage of cases was in the 70 to 79 year age range. For those 18 to 64 years, 82% of GBS cases were female. And for those 65 years and older, 54% of GBS cases were female. Regarding the interval between herpes zoster and GBS, for those 18 to 64 years, a higher proportion of GBS cases occurred within the first 42 days after zoster compared to the primary control window. For those 65 years and older, we observed a higher proportion of GBS cases within the risk window and secondary window compared to the later primary control window. Regarding duration of GBS hospitalization and ICU admission, we identified evidence of more severe GBS among those 65 years and older, with the median duration of hospitalization of nine days and 51% admitted to the ICU. For the self-controlled case series analysis, the rate ratio of GBS was increased during the 42-day risk window following herpes zoster as compared to the primary control window for both age groups, with a rate ratio of 6.3 for those 18 to 64 years of age and a rate ratio of 4.1 for those 65 years and older. For both age groups, the rate ratios during the 42 day risk window following zoster compared to the secondary control windows were not statistically significant given the noted confidence intervals. For those 18 to 64 years of age, the rate ratios of the negative controls were not increased during the 42-day risk window as compared to either control window. These values ranged from 0.9 to 1.2 in the primary control window and 1 to 1.3 in the secondary control window. Given the confidence intervals, these values were not statistically significant. For those 65 years and older, the rate ratios of the negative controls during the 42-day risk window as compared to the control windows ranged from 1 to 1.4 in the primary control window and 0.9 to 1.5 in the secondary control window. Although some confidence intervals indicated statistical significance, all negative control values were much lower than the rate ratio of 4.1 observed for GBS in this age group during the 42-day risk window as compared to the primary control window. There are several strengths and limitations for this study. Regarding strengths, we use large national data sets that include medical and pharmacy claims. The self-controlled case series design inherently controls for potential confounders such as gender and underlying medical conditions, and each case serves as their own control. The study inclusion criteria strengthened herpes zoster and GBS case identification, and the exclusion criteria accounted for potential confounders such as antecedent or previous infections. Regarding limitations, we identified a small number of GBS, GBS cases in both data sources. Market scan is a convenient sample and is not nationally representative and there is a potential for miscoding or misclassification bias in claims data. And finally, we were unable to validate GBS, herpes zoster, or other diagnoses using medical record review. So in conclusion, in the self-controlled case series analysis, we identified an increased risk of GBS in the 42-day window following herpes zoster compared to the primary control window of 100 to 365 days. This increased risk was identified across adult age groups and in two different large administrati administrative data sources. The negative control results strengthened our findings. The negative control rate ratios clustered around the null effect of one 
with a range of 0.9 to 1.4 for the primary control window. And these values were lower than rate ratios for GBS identified in both data sources. Finally, we identified evidence of more severe GBS in terms of longer duration of hospitalization and a higher percentage admitted to the ICU among those 65 years and older. I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Jessica Lung, Dr. Rafael Harpaz, and Dr. Kathleen Dooling for their collaboration on this work, and the ACIP Herpes Zoster Work Group for their valuable feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much for that extensive uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Anderson. Um, I'd just like to say uh, to the members and to liaisons, um, the presentation of this data um, and I, the extensiveness of the data um, really serves to uh, exemplify the, the degree and the, the type of, uh, of collecting systems we have for vaccine safety um, in this country. And I think it, it, it bodes well for uh, the future with regard to monitoring for um, newer vaccines that will be coming out. So thank you very much for presenting this. Um, so I'll turn this over to um, the voting members to see if there are any questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hands if there are. Uh, I see Dr. Lee has a question. Oh, just I, I was hoping um, we might be able to actually go through her last presentation and then take questions all at once, if that's okay, Jose. Sure, we can do that. Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. If we could have the next presentation, please. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I will now provide a summary of the session and ACIP herpes zoster work group discussions, as well as next steps, including a planned risk-benefit analysis regarding the use of recombinant zoster vaccine in immunocompetent adults. Before I begin, though, the herpes zoster work group would like to thank the Immunization Safety Office, as well as the Vaccine Safety Data Link and the FDA for their contributions toward monitoring recombinant zoster vaccine safety. The work group would also like to thank many CDC and other contributors who have provided valuable contributions and insight. Two critical RZV safety monitoring updates from VAERS and VSD were shared during today's session. As discussed by Dr. Sue and Dr. Shima Bakuro regarding VAERS, serious adverse events have rarely been reported, and RZV post-licensure safety monitoring findings in VAERS are generally consistent with the safety profile observed in pre-licensure clinical trials. As discussed by Dr. Nelson regarding the vaccine safety data link, rapid cycle analysis, conducted based on data from January 2018 through December 2019, results from the final chart-confirmed analysis indicate the VSD has insufficient evidence to determine if there's an increased risk of GBS. As was presented during the June 2019 ACIP meeting, FDA has conducted assessments of the risk of GBS following RZV and Medicare data in collaboration with CDC and CMS. The preliminary results of the cohort analysis presented at that meeting which compared the post-vaccination GBS rate between persons 65 years and older who received recombinant zoster vaccine between October 2017 and December 2018, and historical controls who received Zostavax, or ZVL, between October 2012 and September 2017, indicated an elevated adjust rate ratio of 2.34. On the advice of the herpes zoster work group, FDA conducted additional analyses using self-controlled case series methods the FDA has additional results available from the claims-based self-controlled analysis and the medical record review self-controlled analysis. These results are currently under review at FDA and will be shared at a future ACIP meeting. As discussed during my previous presentation, a possible temporal association between herpes zoster and GBS has been noted in a small number of case reports, and one previous epidemiologic study reported an increased risk of GBS following recent herpes zoster. In the CDC-led self-control case series analysis, we identified an increased risk of GBS 1 to 42 days following zoster compared to the primary control window of 100 to 365 days across adult age groups and in two different administrative data sources. I will now provide a brief summary of the herpes zoster workgroup discussion since the June 2019 ACIP meeting. The work group is currently reviewing evidence regarding the use of recombinant zoster vaccine in immunocompromised adults. The work group is concurrently reviewing and discussing findings regarding the possible risk of GBS 
following both disease and vaccination, and agrees that continued safety monitoring of RZV and VARES and VSD is warranted. In addition, a dynamic risk-benefit assessment that incorporates new data on risk of GBS associated with disease and vaccination will inform recommendations on the use of RZV in immunocompetent and immunocompromised adults. This planned risk-benefit analysis will evaluate the benefits of averted herpes zoster cases and complications versus risk factors risks, excuse me, of adverse events. Subject matter experts and the herpes zoster work group will collaborate on model parameters and scenarios. And the outcomes per 1 million vaccinated individuals to be estimated would include episodes of herpes zoster, episodes of postherpetic neuralgia and other zoster complications, such as GBS, injection site reactions, systemic reactions, and rare adverse events, such as GBS. Regarding next steps, we look forward to the discussion of today's presentations. In addition, the Herpes Zoster Workgroup is committed to providing updates to the ACIP at the earliest opportunity. Future meeting presentations will address FDA's assessments of the risk of GBS following RZV and Medicare data, the results of the risk-benefit analysis regarding use of RZV in immunocompetent adults, and recombinant va zoster vaccine use in immunocompromised adults. During our discussion, we would appreciate feedback from ACIP on the following questions. Does ACIP have any other suggested follow-up regarding RZV safety monitoring? And does ACIP have any feedback on the planned risk-benefit analysis for use of recombinant zoster vaccine in immunocompetent adults, particularly any other outcomes of interest? Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll now turn back to Dr. Romero. Thank you. Open for questions from liaisons and from voting members. Dr. Talbot. This has been an amazing amount of work that's been shown today. Um, and. I have been trying to um, filter through all this information as quickly as possible. Um, and I wanna make sure I've done it correctly since I've done it quickly. Are we saying that there is a signal following vaccination that we are not yet clear if it's a random occurrence or a true event? Based on the results to date, it's the safety profile is reassuring. Uh, we are continuing to follow up given the previous results from the FDA analysis showing an elevated adjusted um, risk in the Medicare data, and also given the um, study results that I just presented regarding the risk of GBS that's also been noted for um, an association with GBS. Okay, so I guess um, regardless of GBS associated with herpes zoster, um, the numbers that you showed did not show no risk after vaccination unless I misread that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, do we, we talk about GBS as one in a million for influenza. Can you give me an idea of that number for the current shingles vaccine? Not at this time. The results that have been shared to date are related to the um, information that I shared on the slides based on the um, RZV versus the ZVL comparator group. So the elevated adjusted um, ratio of 2.34. So what are the plans for the future studies and future evidence to be brought to ACIP? The FDA yeah, intends, yes, the FDA yeah. intends to present um, at a future meeting the results of their self-control case series analyses. Those results, as I mentioned, um, are under review at this time with FDA and they'll share them as soon as possible. Okay. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm 
I'm slightly hesitant um, that this is a vaccine with a very powerful adjuvant. Um, and I think with the prior recommendation for preferential use, the prior vaccine is no longer available or will no longer be available. Doctor, um, so I think it's Dr. Talbot, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second because Dr. Messonnier wants to make a comment. Actually, I, I want to make sure that I'm articulating. It is, um, and I am sorry, it is so hard in this virtual environment. So I want to make sure that we're um, uh, answering your question appropriately. And I kind of think I know where you're going, but I'm going to ask our subject matter expert. Um, there are there's a, there are two studies that show a positive signal, but you don't actually haven't completed the risk benefit evaluation that would get to the additional risk of GBS um, compared to the risk of prevention of zoster. And there is a third study that FDA is doing that we expect and hope to have before February. Is that correct? Or if not, please correct yes, me, because sure. I may not be right. <laughs> yes. So as Dr. Nelson um, shared today, the results of the VSD analysis um, indicated initially there was a signal for GBS, but over time that signal has attenuated. So now the results of that study do not indicate, um, they don't have sufficient evidence to you know, say that there's a signal in VSD. In VAERS, there has not been a signal. In the initial results that have been pre presented to date by FDA, their initial um, cohort analysis, there was an adjusted um, risk, elevated risk in the RZV versus the ZVL comparator group. And so that is what's been presented to date. The results of their self-controlled case series analyses, also using Medicare data, um, will be presented at another time. They're currently under review at FDA. So yes, we're waiting on the results of those analyses. And then in the meantime, what we're also discussing doing and from the work group's recommendation is to move forward with this planned risk-benefit analysis um, where we would be taking into consideration new information that would be related to the um, possible risk of GBS after vaccination, as well as the risk of GBS after infection. Okay. So I hope that clarifies things. Before we go back to Kip, I'm going to ask you for another question. Sure. Um, I think she's asking, what is the upper bounds of the potential increased risk? So in other words, GBS is one in a million. I know mm -hmm. that there are still data, but I think she's trying to get to what's the absolute maximum risk. In other words, um, is there enough data to, to, to be concerned enough to act now as opposed to waiting for additional analysis? Is that... Yes, at this point, I don't believe that we've had additional, sufficient evidence or sufficient information presented in order to be able to determine that, so. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. I appreciate that. And I just, I, I'm looking forward to more data. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, very good. Uh, Dr. Lee. Yes, thank you. I just, I wanted to also uh, be able to respond. Um, so um, I'll just kind of repeat the summary just so uh, we're all on the same page. So first, I wanted to emphasize what Dr. Romero said, which is that uh, we absolutely rely on our vaccine safety surveillance systems to detect signals. Um, these signals in VAERS and, uh, well, the signal in VSD was presented previously, and also the surveillance from VAERS was presented previously. Um, and, and on long-term sort of, uh, not on long-term, on follow-up of those signals, those signals have attenuated in those databases over time. Um, we are waiting for the FDA CMS analysis. Obviously that, um, that database has the greatest power to be able to give us the information needed. In addition to, um, uh, you know, at, at that time we were focused on making sure that these cases are validated. So the way I would frame this is that um, if you're thinking about signals, uh, we detected a statistical signal, um, and after a statistical signal is identified, um, we would go on to conduct signal refinement activities and signal evaluation activities. And those activities are underway in several systems. Today, you heard that the VAERS and VSG systems, those signals um, are uh, not identified in VAERS and have attenuated in VSD. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing the FDA CMS data, uh, again, because they have a large proportion of older adults 
who are receiving these vaccines. And so I think that will be um, very helpful to ensuring that we are making decisions based on the best possible data. So that's part one. Um, part two, I think, you know, also really important was this analysis of GBS following disease. Um, and I have to say that I, um, had not intuitively understood uh, the, the high rate of GBS following um, herpes zoster infection. Um, I had appreciated it following Campylobacter or other types of infections, but I had not had this on my radar. Um, the reason I think that's important and I wanna call that out is because it's different than the way we're used to thinking uh, about uh, vaccine safety, which is against the background of a general population. Um, I think it's really important to remember that the benefit risk analysis is really around um, people who get the disease and people who are vaccinated. So having the rates of an, um, GBS following herpes zoster infection is actually incredibly helpful to help understand the benefit risk balance in the population, particularly for this vaccine. Uh, we absolutely at the work group think that the vaccine safety uh, needs to undergo continued monitoring uh, brought these results today, which is a lot of information agree um, regarding the, where we are in terms of uh, the vaccine safety evaluation as well as uh, evaluation following disease, because we think it's so important from a transparency perspective to bring all this data to ACIP. We anticipate more data will be forthcoming, um, but the reason we're proposing this benefit risk analysis is because of uh, uh, both the statistical signal that's continuing to undergo evaluation, as well as um, this new information regarding the risk of GBS following herpes zoster infection. Um, and to your point, I think that is exactly what we wanna to bring to ACIP for discussion. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bell. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to this discussion um, and make um, two points. The first being to just echo um, how important what you said, Dr. Romero, and also Dr. Lee about um, the importance of these safety monitoring systems um, for um, all of the, our new vaccines. And in that context, I think um, you know we do want to remember that we've been evaluating this signal but the evaluation is ongoing. And, and you know, I think this sort of issue needs to be worked out over time. You need to keep looking at it as more people get vaccinated and you know, address signals as they arise. And perhaps the signal for GBS will change over time. And that's what we're, you know, we're looking for that. And the other point is that um, another potential benefit of doing a risk benefit analysis is a sensitivity analysis that could be part of the process that um, might help with, you know, some of the questions, for example, around what Dr. Talbot is asking, that is, you know, what's the upper bound? Where would this risk benefit balance shift with respect to, for example, an association between vaccination and GBS? So I think um, there's benefit to using this risk benefit analysis partially as another way of exploring uh, the meaning and the potential impact of um, these uh, signals as they arise. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, next, uh, Dr. Hunter. Uh, thanks. Um, I am very reassured by the data that's being presented right now, and I'm the person that voted against the re preferred recommendation. Um, and I think I'm almost to the point, I think I'd need more data, but um, I'm almost to the point where I could say to my patients, 50 year old patients who are coming, asking about, you know, they've heard that, uh, you know, there might be this signal on GBS with a vaccine to say what um, I generally say for influenza vaccine, which is, you know, you're, you're actually going to be at lower risk uh, if you, if you get the vaccine, because you're, you're going to protect against getting herpes zoster outbreak. So um, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm a clinician, I'm, a, uh, I'm looking at this data without the sophisticated eye of uh, cost benefit analysis that Dr. Lee and others who do research like Dr. Talbot, but um, I think that this, this initial data is very reassuring to me. So I just want to mention that. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I'm just wondering, so consumers understand when you estimate um, timing wise an update on the risk benefit analysis, as well as the FDA assessment. 
Yes, we anticipate presenting those as soon as possible at an upcoming meeting of the ACIP. Yes, ideally February. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, February. <laughs> Are there any other questions from uh, the voting members? Do any liaison members have a uh, question or comment? Dr. Anderson, Dr. Lee, uh, questions were posed at the end of your presentation. Uh, do you, did we provided you with information that you wanted at the very end? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we, as I mentioned, we just wanted to make sure that the ACIP members, um, if they did not have any other suggested follow-up regarding safety monitoring okay. or any particular feedback regarding what we proposed here for the business. Okay. So if there's, it doesn't sound like there's any Very good. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Cohn wants to make a comment. Yeah, I just want to add uh, to reassure everyone as well, uh, when the FDA data are available for review on the work group, if there is concerning data that would um, uh, necessitate uh, needing to meet earlier in order for the ACIP to uh, review the data before February, um, that can absolutely be done. Over. Thank you. All right, um, then um, we're a little early, um, but we'll break now for lunch um, and uh, return at 20 after the hour. Uh, for uh, tick-borne encephalitis vaccine introduction by uh, Dr. Paling. So uh, enjoy your lunch, and we'll see, our, we'll see you all um, in a little while.